The Man in the Dark, dramatized by Gwen Cheryl from the novel by John Ferguson, with Robert Trotter, Karin Fernald, Christopher Schooler, and Kenneth McClellan. The Thames Embankment, London, the year 1921. The Man in the Dark. Spare a copper, mister. <laughs> mister! <laughs> It's a tight plane, anything. Nobody about night like this. Hello. Now, China. Uh-huh. I'll move up, then. It's a bit of room. Uh... How are you, Boomer? Yeah. What do you know, my name? I have a good memory. I... I have to have. I... I didn't send you none of my letters, did I? Begging letter to me. Oh, look at me, man. I'm in rags. Well, you might be one of my gents <laughs> fell on our time. <laughs> this, uh, this your billet for the night, then? Oh, there's a chance of being run in here. Oh, yeah. Well, this won't give you no trouble tonight. Not in this fog. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, I'm going down to Doss House. Coming. The sound of men screaming in the snow. The stink. Stench of sweat and worse. Yeah. A bit like wipers, isn't it? Still. When the trams have stopped running, the embankment's as quiet as anywhere. I remember you now. You're the chap. And I was a doctor. Listen, Ely. What? Yeah, uh... Doctor. Fellow you Oh, him. Yeah, we looked him up in that dictionary in a public library. Directory. Medical directory. Yeah. Aye. You tried touching him for a quid? No. Why not? I couldn't beg from him. I I haven't seen him for years. Last time we met, we were students. Before... Before... Before you got your blighty. You're too proud, mate. That's your trouble. Ain't your fault you got a rifle butt in the face. There's hundreds. There's far... You stop there. I'm going to raise the price of a cup of tea. I tell you, Punson B. Paget is a journalistic genius, McNabb. He's a genius for raking muck, I'll give you that. Where's the luck, Governor? He prints the truth. He prints half-truths. The public opens his lousy rag and reads, There is no truth in the rumour. And they think, Aha, they think, What rumour is this? That's what I'm saying. He uses the oldest tricks in Fleet Street. He starts rumours by denying them. And he sells like hotcakes. It's dirty, laddie, it's dirty. Nobody in public life is free from his innuendos. Spare a copper, mister. There's no denying his circulation figures. They're higher than John Bull. Yes, no wonder John Bull don't prosecute him. What for? For pinching their layout as well as pinching their readers. Ah, look at it. Street lighting makes it even worse. Good luck to you, Captain. The eye-opener. What a name for a responsible weekly. Well, it is an eye opener. If serviceman, Major. Like yourself, Colonel. Oh, well, for God's sake. For only two pence, Punsonby Paget opens the eyes of the British people. Impudence. His own face on the cover. Britannia's eyes are opened. I wonder how much it costs to shut her mouth. What? The price probably varies. Depends who he's got in his clutches at the time. And you, Mr. Godfrey Chance, rising young journalist, you'd work for this Pegswell? He liked that article I showed him. I think he admired my cheek. I took it out to his house. Stick to the daily record, laddie. It's an honest paper. But, Nab, you're a humbug. You like the record because it pays for the odd article. Excuse me, Governor, excuse me. That the eye out now? Yeah, do you want it? Yeah, not half. You like it? Oh, like it. Keeps the cold out of treat, this does. Here. Get yourself a hot drink. Oh, it's all gone. Thanks very much. Are you going back to the records office, Mr. Chance? Yes. I'll come with you. What did he give you? Tanner. Yeah. I'll spray it with you. Good change. Change? I haven't a penny in the world. Aren't you? 
Yeah, look. You take this. Buy yourself a ticket to Ealing. No, man, no. Now, listen, listen. Look, I'm not giving it. I'm lending it. And I want it back, see? With interest. Now, going out to Ealing on the underground, you're going to see your doctor, pal. You're going to make a touch. And I'll be waiting back at a DOS house for my half share. Got it? Hello. Well, I'm not producing comic cuts, you know. Stupid, ma'am. Yeah. Take those two chaps we saw just now, down on the embankment. They're the men Thompson B. Paget speaks for. Ex-service men who fought for a land fit for heroes, men who come home to find corruption rampant. There are profiteers in this country who are still making money hand over fist. Paget exposes them. And makes the fortune for himself while he's at it. He's a great man. He speaks for England. Oh, dear, dear. That's why he's worshipped. Not by his victims, he's not. Victims? You're very naive, Mr. Chance, if you think that all Paget's money comes from the proceeds of his Tuppany Weekly newspaper. Uh, what do you mean? Some comes from what he threatens to print, not what he actually prints. You're not suggesting he takes bribes. Paget takes bribes not to publish. This is 1921, Mr. Chance. Men in public life don't take bribes, nor do they give them. They merely uh, do business together. Dear me, what a lot you have to learn. Evening, McNabb. Charles, I want you. Yes, sir. Lead article, Foreign Secretary's speech. Yes, sir. Copies on my desk. Go and get it. Uh, right, sir. McNabb. No, sir. What? No, Mr. Matheson. I am not your employee. I'm merely a private investigator and your special correspondent in the event of a special crime. How's business? Find me a good crime. Find me one and I'll run your story. Plus expense. If it's a good crime and a baffling one. Baffling to the police, that is. The old man wants to have a go at them. The police? I'm sorry for that. I'm a great admirer of the police force. Why didn't you join it then, instead of setting up on your own? What are you looking for? I was wondering if Mr. Chance kept any sustenance in his day. Chance? He's a teetotaler, you know that. I meant food. Aha! Biscuits. Who is Stephen Ware, Mr. Matheson? Who? The rumor that Sir Stephen Ware will be nominated for the Bywitch Division is without foundation. Where did you get that? From the eye opener. Oh, that rag. Are you going to run the story? What story? And anyway, who's Stephen Ware? I wonder if Punson B. Paget's put his hands on him. Don't you? Have a biscuit. Ware. Yeah. yeah, the only Ware I can think of is Ware the financier. Uh huh? A couple of years ago, he got mixed up in a merchant bank that failed. Why did it fail? It handled some of the profits made by the munitions millionaires out of the manufacture of poison gas. Mucky money. The friendly societies wouldn't touch it. Too many of their members were gassed themselves. Matheson. Good evening, Mr. Matheson. This is Punson B. Paget. An unexpected honor, Mr. Paget. Uh, for me, my dear fellow. I didn't expect the deputy editor of the record to be the handmaiden to his own minion. You want Godfrey Chance? If I may. It's a personal matter. Chance! Now, oh, what's he up to? Chance? No, oh, P.P. Chance! The great man himself. He's coming. Yes, sir. A telephone. And my office, when you've finished. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Godfrey Chance. Good evening, my dear young man. Mr. Paget. Short notice, but like you, I am a busy man. I want you to have dinner with me tonight. Tonight? At my house. It means leaving right away. You have my address. But, Mr. Paget. I'll be waiting for you. But, Mr. Paget, I can't. What? I've got an article to write, and then I have to... Damn. Certainly, by then. Ah, good. Now, this is a big thing for you. Take the sack rather than disappoint me. You understand? Uh, yes. Good. I'm afraid I shan't be able to offer you supper. But a man on whom I can rely may hope for something more than his supper before long. That was... So it was. He wants me to go to his house. You had better look sharp. The folk's coming down thicker than ever. Where does he live? In Ealing. Oh, 
At midnight. Hmm? A meal like that's been no more than a memory to me for the last two years, Peter. Two years? Mm Mm-hmm. Ah. Your health, Dr. Dunn. And yours, Sunday. And, uh, talking of your health, if you want my diagnosis... I... I don't. As I said, I just happen to be in the neighborhood. You're in bad shape. Bad shape? (laughs) Frankly, if it hadn't been for your voice, I'd never have recognized you. Now, your clothes, man, and your hair... Long hair's a badge of respectability where I come from. Is it? Most of the men in the Doss house wear the close crop of the convicted vagrant, Peter. Ah, yes. Ah, yes, you see. Ah, yes. You sit here in the comfort of a successful practice. Warm fire, good scotch. Have you any idea what it's like to have absolutely nothing? Not even hope? Your injuries must have been very painful. Which injuries do you mean? You're bitter, Sandy. Very. And, if you'll forgive me, too damn sorry for yourself. What? Well, you had brilliant prospects. You threw them away. For what? All students fancied themselves as writers, for God's sake. Even I did. But I had the guts to get out and try. And I'd have made good if it hadn't been for the war. You damned fool. If you'd stayed in medicine... Thank you for your hospitality, Dr. Dunn. And now, if you'll forgive me... Sit down and don't be so touchy. If I'm angry, it's only for you. If only you'd qualified. Dr. Kinlaw? At least you'd have escaped your present calamity. I'd have been safe in a base hospital like you, you mean, instead of being smashed to hell in the trenches. If it's all the same to you, I'll take my leave. Sandy, don't be so pig-headed. Good night, Doctor. Wait. Look, take this. No, thank you. Your dignity is ludicrous, Kinlaw. I don't want to have to pocket your insults and your money. I'd be obliged if you'd open the door. Thank you. Oh, wait. Good Lord, I've forgotten that. What? The fog. I can't let you go out in that. It's worse than ever. Fog makes no difference to me, Dr. Dunn. Goodbye. Wait. Wait. There's something important. Come back, Sandy. Sandy! Away with you, then, I'll be damned. (laughs) Damned, indeed. Oh, dear God, it's cold. Oh, oh. Oh, God, you're for soaking wet. (laughs) You're as scruffy as I am. But you're warmer. You're much, much warmer. Where are we now, cabby? I'm sorry, Chuck. I can't see. You asked me for going round in circles. Oh, I thought we'd have been out of the worst of it by now. You want me to go on? Uh, what time is it? Oh, past midnight. Go on. Oh, damn you, look where you're going. Where am I? Let go of me. Take your hands off me. Uh, sorry, I... I trying to stop myself falling. And then I, I mistook the, the fur on your coat cover for a cat. A cat? I, it, it was here a moment ago. I beg your pardon. Ah, that's better. You recognize who I am? Uh, no, sir, I do not. Oh, take a closer look. The most famous face in the country. I'm sorry, I, I can't. George, the very man. There's something providential about this meeting, my friend. How would you like to earn five pounds? <laughs> I'd do much at the moment for five pounds. Yes, I expect you would. Now, listen carefully. A man is coming to my house, and it's essential that the third party should be present. A witness had been arranged for, but he's failed. All I want you to do is simply to make it evident to my visitor that I am not alone. Do you think you're capable of that? How? I I don't understand. Oh, come with me. I'll explain. I'll just close the curtains. 
I shall close, but not lock the French windows. I'm not certain which entrance my visitor will choose for his arrival. Leather-bound books, brandy, cigars, the aroma of fine now, living. behind the screen is a chair and a table. What I want you to do is to sit here, my good man, and when I give the signal, make a noise as if you are busy with some papers. Now, give me that stick. No, I'd rather keep it. I'll lay it across my knees. Oh, very well. Now, I'll just draw the screen round you. I shall now give three taps on the fender with the poker. Are you ready? Ready. Right? Oh. Did you not hear it? Yes, but I can't find the papers. You've forgotten the papers. Well, try these. They'll sound like music in your ears. One, two, three, four, five pounds. Oh, music to me, certainly. Not very audible to your visitor. I'll cough, then. Cough. But only after I've tapped on the fender three times. Now, let's shut you in again. There. I'll make the fire up. He surely won't be long now. It's past midnight already. Just when everything seemed hopeless. Did you say something? Warm room, comfortable chair. <laughs> oh. oh, mustn't fall asleep. Mustn't fall asleep. Just the journey wasn't too unpleasant. One travels hopefully. Of course, especially on an errand like this. Whiskey, I'm honored that you should come. And interested. Oh. Interested in what? Why, your career. A promising politician rising rapidly in public life. What can stop this young man from reaching the top, I ask myself. What indeed? Oh, notes were well, Nothing notes. that I can think of. Than you? There is one thing. Oh, it's chilly in here. Would you like me to rouse the fire? Uh-huh. As I was saying, there is one thing, one small indiscretion, which could be erased. Ah, I see. The evidence of it purchased, you mean. Oh, come. And if I refuse to be blackmailed? <gasps> All I'm suggesting is a little business arrangement. I surely don't take you by surprise. No, you don't. I have come prepared. Excellent. We'll get down to business right away. <coughs> Who's that? I am also prepared. We are not alone. So that's your game. Well, this time you've mistaken your man. <laughs> Fistic, I'll say. Oh, you fool. Violence won't help you. What? Put that knife away. Oh, my God. You're afraid. The all-powerful bully is afraid. Keep off! Keep off! Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What are you afraid for? Your life? Your miserable life? Keep off! Keep off! off! One end for vermin like you. Help! Help! Oh, no. No. Oh. 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 My stick! Where's my stick? Ah! Oh, where? Ah, uh, the rat crawls out from behind the ass. Uh, my hands! What, what have I got on my hands? Stay where you are. Don't move. Is it, is it blood? Oh! The wall. Let me, let me lean against the wall. Do as I say, rat. Cringing, groveling rat. Jim, if I could... Crawling on all fours. Come here. Don't, 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 don't come, come here. Come here, rat. <laughs> I learnt what to do with rats in Palestine. Turks, rats, it's all the same to me. <laughs> my hair, let, let go, you're pulling my hair. Now, a keen blade, you see? No, no. Mercy. Show me some mercy. Don't! 
No more. Don't kill him. Please, don't kill him. Don't interfere. Please. Shut up. Look at him. He's nothing. He's not important. Yes. Yes, look at me. Look at me. Can't you see? Can't you see? How did you know Mr. Paget was dead, Mr. Charles? I've attended too many police courts and inquests not to know that, Inspector Green. Mm -hmm. When there was no answer, I walked round the house, saw the French windows were open, and found, well, all this as it is now. How about my ringing my editor again, Inspector? I've never had an exclusive before, and this All in good time, sir. Uh, Well, Dr. Dunn, what do you think? Well, I'll tell you this, Inspector. The hand that sent that knife to the heart was an expert's. He struck upwards. Mm. Is that unusual? Well, downwards is the natural inclination. The trained killer pierces from below. Soldier, would you say? Possibly. Mm. Now, if you don't need my services anymore, Inspector, it's nearly morning. Well, I wouldn't mind your opinion on this, sir. Battered old walking stick. My God. What is it? Did you find that here? Yes, on the floor, under that screen. I was going to ask you how tall you think the man is who owns it. You uh, think it might have been left by the criminal? Plain oak, pretty battered. It doesn't seem to go with Mr. Paget somehow. No. No, that, that, that's why I was so surprised. Well, I'd guess at least six feet tall, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Uh, can I have a look at it? Yes, the prince men have finished with it. Uh, well, Green, what have you got here? Oh, hello, Inspector Snargo. <laughs> Thank goodness. What? You're not going to sulk. Most local coppers sulk when the yard's brought in. <laughs> I could hardly expect to keep him to myself, could I? The most famous face in England. So... Signs of a struggle, furniture overturned. No sign of the weapon. Uh, no. Forensics been in? Yeah. And gone. Mm. Decanter of whiskey, half empty. And two tumblers smashed. Two, eh? What's in this envelope? A little contribution of mine, sir. Several long black hairs snatched out by the roots, seemingly. Where'd you find them? Over by the wall, just below those blood stains. Good Lord. What the devil? Yeah, remarkable, isn't it? Smears of blood three feet up from the floor, plastered all along the wall. Paget? So the doctor reckons, but nowhere near where he fell. Ah, that's right. Ah, what else? In this envelope, see? Ah, more glass. A splinter, but it's not from the drinking glasses. It's a fragment of looking glass. A mirror? Well, there's been quite a fight here. Did a mirror fall down in the rough and tumble? No, according to the servants, there's no mirror in this room. Uh, where were the servants? They're asleep. Their quarters are in the coach house across the drive. Ah. Where's the chap who found him? Uh, I did. Uh, Godfrey Chance, daily record. What are you doing here? Well, I was invited. For one o'clock in the morning? I was delayed by the fog. Mr. Paget had telephoned me earlier in the evening. I didn't want him to think I'd failed him without making an effort. Did he mention any other guests? No. If a decanter of whiskey and two glasses was set, I take it that one of the glasses would be for you. No. Oh? Why not? I don't drink. Would he know that? I told him the first time we met. He never forgot details like that. Is that your walking stick? No. Whose is it, then? Oh. Oh. Oh, my head. How are you feeling? Oh. What can you remember? Remember? Remember. The wall. The wall, it, it's here. You're all right. It must be on, on my left. When I fell, it, it was on my left. You're all right. Well, surely the wall... Has he gone? That man who was here, the, the visitor, has he gone? Uh, look out, he's got a pistol. It's all right. That was the switch for the light under the dash. Uh, the dash. I turned it on to see if you were all right. Try to sleep. I must watch the road. We're in a car. Yes. Uh, did, did you put these bandages on the back of my head? Yes. Where are we? You'll soon see. Last night, Mr. Punsonby Paget was sitting where I'm sitting now. I'm reconstructing for you, McNabb. Thank you, Inspector Snargrove. He was expecting someone, a friend. 
Someone who didn't turn up. Not for want of trying. Not, Mr. Chance. It was somebody else. Oh? According to the butler, the whiskey decanter had been filled in readiness for a guest. Like Mr. Chance, he didn't turn up either. But somebody else did. Somebody who was uninvited. The murderer? Very good, Mr. Chance. Probably he was a burglar. And the owner of the walking stick. But then... Uh... Why did he knife Paget? Why didn't he just clout him with his stick? A burglar or not, he was a cool customer. He calmly stuck a knife into Paget and then had the gall to help himself to his whiskey. Really? From the fingerprints on the tumbler fragments, it's evident that Paget lifted his glass more than once. The other glass was used once only. Who takes his whiskey in one gulp? Any good Scotty, McNabb? Ah, Certainly right, not an invited fireside guest. Much more likely it would be burglar, who's just committed murder and feels the need for a slug. Are there any blood stains on the tumbler? No. Apart from Paget's, which you'd expect, there's uh, just this one set, clear on the crystal. That's odd. Why? You reckon he took the dram after he'd killed Paget? Yes. That wall is most horribly bloodstained. Whose prints are those? Paget's? No. Whose are they? <laughs> My dear McNabb, they're the burglars. So he must have taken this nip before he killed Paget. Otherwise, the bloodstains would be on the glass as well as on the wall. Hmm. A cool customer, you say, Snargrove? Look at these marks. The man who clawed that wall wasn't calm. He was frantic. Well... We know he was lame. Maybe he fell down and was trying to drag himself upright when he heard my taxi cab. Why didn't he make for the door, then? None of these marks leads towards the doors. It looks to me as if he was searching for something. Searching for something? For what? The electric light switch. <laughs> Three feet up from the floor. Besides, the lights were on when I arrived. Where are they? Oh. Oh, I'm surprised. I had the feeling that he must have been in the dark. Why? Well, surely he wouldn't have left all this evidence against himself if he could have seen what he was doing. Fingerprints, locks of hair, fragments of his pocket mirror. Well, he could see all right. How else could he have aimed the knife so accurately? Mm, well, you're right. It's a complete paradox. Cold-blooded murder and blind panic. You know, Inspector Snargrove, what interests me? Huh? As a policeman, you try to reconstruct the crime and everything that led up to it. I always want to know what happened immediately afterwards. Where is he now, I ask myself? And what's he doing? We passed through a small town a while back. I thought you were asleep. Uh, I heard a church clock strike. Why are you putting the light on again? I'm not. I'm turning off the headlights. Look, it's almost daylight. Breath of air. How do you come to be associated with such an evil man? What? He was wicked. Your face isn't altogether wicked. Lady, my face is smashed, unshaven and unwashed. There isn't a light enough for you to see that. If you'll sit up and look, you'll see for yourself. Through those trees, straight ahead, look daybreak and the birds i decided to drop you just along this road what for to get rid of you is that man dead yes it's a hanging business then look you'll be out of it forget what you saw last night keep out of the way of the police and you'll be all right i see all this solicitude for me and my escape it's for the murderer's safety never mind about that how is it that you're associated with such a wicked man? Stop the car. Drop me here. You make me sick. You know, lady, you might as well have saved yourself the trouble. I didn't see the man who was murdered. What? Nor the man who killed him. I can't see you either. I'm blind. Blind? Yes. Sharper eyes than yours missed that in the fog last night. Didn't even know where I was. So you're free. You're free to drive away. 
Why don't you? I gave you good news, didn't I? Somebody's coming. Get back in the car. No time. What are you doing? I'll pretend to be looking at your tires. Don't hide. Look as if you were doing your hair or something. Yes, all right. Where's my bag? What is it? Nothing. Get down. Morning. Good morning, officer. Not too bad for January, is it? You in trouble, miss? No, thank you. Ah. Oh, well, then, I'll be on my way. Has he gone? He stared at you. Who was it? A policeman. A country bobby on his round. What took you by surprise just now? Nothing. When? When you opened your handbag, you saw something that surprised you. Oh, my mirror was smashed to pieces, that's all. Please get back in the car or he'll be after me. I, I thought you said he'd gone. Why should he come back? Please. And anyway, you've just turned me loose. For heaven's sake, you're covered in blood. Ah. Of course he'll be after us. You're an appalling sight. Oi! Oh. I say! Quick, get in. Did he get your number? No, I didn't give him time. Where are we going? Where I'd meant to go in the first place. A village. What village? Oh, never mind. Did you intend to take me there? What? made you change your mind and throw me out? Was it my face? Or was it my ignoble behavior? I don't know what you mean. I mean, did you remember that last night I groveled in front of your murdering friend? And what is it now? Remorse for the way he struck a blind man? Don't. You know, lady, in the war I felt no resentment against the man who blinded me. It was him or me on equal terms. Last night, I had to get down on my knees and, and beg for mercy for my sordid murderer. And for that, by God, I'll get him. Get him? You don't think I will? I don't see how you can. You don't even know where you are. Isn't that what you said? I'll find out. How, how far is this village? You'll get no help there. I'll manage. It's completely cut off. There are gates at either end of it. There's a cottage. An old woman has the key. We can lie low there. We? The cottage is isolated. No one will know you're there. Except the old woman. She won't. I thought you said that... I'll look after you. And nobody will see us arriving. A, a blood bolter down and out and a, a well-dressed woman. I take it you are well-dressed. You have a very expensive smell. You can stay hidden till dark. Then I'll let you in. I see. You'll have to trust me not to make a run for it. Won't you? What is it? My stick. What? My stick. What stick? Oh. You didn't bring it? Of course I didn't bring it. I didn't know then. Where is it? In that room. Well, it must be. It, it was beside my chair, behind the screen. What does it look like? Is it painted white? No. Are your initials on it? Oh, and there's a silver tip, perhaps, with an ivory handle. Can it be identified? As my friend Beaumont would say, there's hundreds, thousands just like it. Who's Beaumont? I... A man I met in the Doss house. Did he know you were going to that house last night? Lady, nobody knew I was going to that house last night. Least of all me. Quickly. Get in. The door's open. There's just one step. Quickly. Quickly. You're in. Oh, thank heavens. I'm sorry. You must be frozen hidden out there all day like that. Come near the fire and get warm. No. What? I want to see what I am. See? See? You thought I was helpless, lady. I'm not. I'd stay where you are. Oh, you've just flopped into a basket chair uh, near the fire. Don't move. Fire, uh, oil lamp on my left, on the table. Aha, a timbered ceiling. I can reach it so the room must be under eight foot high. House is old. Uh, rag rugs on a stone flag floor. And you're scared. 
scared out of your life. I'm not afraid of you. You're afraid for your murdering friend and your right to be. He made a great mistake when he hit me. He should have killed me. No. Look, I've been trying to work it out all day. Why did you bring me away from that house? Why didn't you both just clear out and leave me? A tramp off the streets who would have believed me if I'd denied killing the man. I, I even had a motive. I had five pounds of his money. Why didn't you leave me? Have you worked it out? Yes. Tell me. When your friend savaged me, he hit me across the back of my skull. So, when I fell, I fell on top of a dead man, didn't I? I can't remember. I can. So, if I'd been found there, who could have gashed the back of my head? Not me. Not the dead man. It could only have been somebody else, and that somebody else could only have been his murderer. Bravo. So, you take me away, and now the police are looking for only one man. That's right. Me. No, an unknown assailant. Uh-huh. So, both your murdering friend and I are safe only for so long as I remain hidden. And unknown. Ha. Ah. Nobody knows we were there. The police know? They must stick. Oh, it was a good idea to take me hostage. It was also very dangerous. Where are you going? To heat up some water. Your head is bleeding again. Never mind my head. I want to know what you intend to do now we're here. I've made up a bed for you in the spare room. It's over there to your left. I have a key. Once you're in it, and when I have to go out to the village to buy food... And uh, newspapers, you'll buy newspapers. I shall lock you in that room. When I'm in the house, you'll be free to walk about. There are no stairs. I see. You regard me as your prisoner. <laughs> Why do you smile? Because, oddly enough, lady, I regard you as mine. It'll be interesting to see which of us is right, won't it? Tea? Biscuit? Have a biscuit. Uh, no, thanks. And for goodness sake, close the window. I can feel the dump rising from the river all the way up here. If you will have offices off the strand. The offices. An attic with a gas ring. Snargrove's not going to solve this case, Mr. Chance. Why not? He's closed his mind. He thinks that the chappie who killed Paget was the same fellow who crawled round the room on his hands and knees. This extraordinary fop of a fellow. Hmm? He carries a pocket mirror, yet he wears his hair unfashionably long. One minute he's in a blind panic, and the next minute he's having a quiet nip of whiskey and calmly limping away, leaving his walking stick behind. Mm. You saw that stick. Describe it. Well, it was, um, practical, thick. Much used? Oh, Lord, yes. Well worn? Yes. A handle? Uh, grimy, sweaty. The tip? The tip? The other end from the handle? Uh, well, I didn't... Uh... No, you didn't, did you? I did. That was very well worn, too, but not where you'd expect it to be. How do you mean? A lame man leans heavily on either his right side or his left. Sooner or later, his stick gets worn down on the side nearest his gammy leg. Which side was this stick worn down on? Neither. Here's your tea. Oh, thanks. The wear and tear was straight across. What does that mean? The poor devil was blind. Good Lord. That stick belongs to a blind man. A blind man. And an innocent one. Why hasn't he reported? What happened then? Why didn't he go to the police? I wonder. Where is he? And what was he doing there in the first place? He wasn't an accomplice, that's for sure. Who'd take a blind man to assist in a murder? Y y you mean he was there by accident? He just happened to stumble in on it? Well, one o'clock in the morning? What if he'd found a shakedown for the night in Paget's garden? We can reckon he was poor, perhaps destitute. Mm -hmm. He heard Paget cry for help. The French windows were open. He went to help him stumbled over that screen and then fell over Paget's body. Very unpleasant for him. It can't have been all that cosy for the murderer. 
Find out the names of all blind persons who were reported missing from home that night. Good idea. Shouldn't take long. Please, God, there aren't that many. And I want you to look out for any reports of unidentified bodies. You think they might have done him in as well? They? Why they? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, well, well, I wouldn't fancy carrying a six-footer on my own, would you? He was spirited away somehow, wasn't he? He certainly didn't walk away on his own, otherwise he'd have taken his stick. There are no signs of his being dragged, so he must have been knocked out and carried. Mr. Chance, you've just made a bright suggestion. Oh, thanks. That would explain why the murderer suddenly turned squeamish. Why he didn't just knife our blind fellow. Why? It might also explain those fragments of looking glass. What have they got to do with it? I should have remembered. Where there's trouble, cherchez la femme. Good morning. Mm. Mm. Oh. Oh. Mm. I, I smell coffee, bacon. Will that be all right again? Mm. Oh. Smooth sheets, silk pajamas. Very nice. How's the head? Oh, better every day. Breakfast in five minutes. Mm. At what time is it? 7.30. The old woman is coming in at nine, as usual. Oh, I'll be out in five minutes. Uh, listen. Hello! She's here. Stay here. Don't move. Mrs. Betty! <laughs> these days. Three eggs, eight rashes. Oh, oh, well, there's nothing like a great big breakfast that'll put the roses back. That and some good long walks along the downs. Oh, like when he was a little of Miss Stella. Ha, oh, and now you're a wedding. <coughs> Mrs. Preble, show me your photograph in the record. Old Jacob Witch. Now, you remember old Jacob Witch at the post office? Well, he wrapped it round a pot of treacle and didn't never notice there was your photograph. But Mrs. Preble didn't then. Oh, what's the matter, me lady? Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I was leaning on this door. I didn't notice it was open. I thought I'd closed it. Stella. Hmm. Your name is Stella. It means a star. Appropriate, in this case. Why? Well, ask yourself. What does a star usually mean to a, a blind man? I don't know. Nothing. Star to a blind man? Nothing. You said usually. Ah, in this case, Stella, you are going to be my guiding light. You are going to lead me to your murder. Don't say your murdering friend. Not again, please. To your husband. Oh. oh, that's right. Bury your nose in the newspaper. What's your name? I wondered when you were going to ask me that. Alexander David Kinloch. Can I believe you? You have no reason not to. Alexander David Kinloch. I thought at first it might have been a crime of passion, a lover stabbing a man to save his mistress. Oh, your man killed to save himself. The action of a husband. You're cynical. A husband who can count on the absolute loyalty of his wife. What's in the newspaper? Nothing. The most famous man in the country stabbed to death and there's still nothing. It just says the police are questioning a number of people. Ah, his previous victims, no doubt. I thought you said you didn't know who he was. So, we just go on lying low, letting the evidence accumulate. They won't connect it with you. Oh, I didn't mean that evidence. What then? The evidence that I'm accumulating here in this house. What evidence? Oh, you're English, upper middle, upper crust, rich, drive your own car. It's a two-seater. 
But it's yours because I had to fold myself up like a penknife. No man of normal height could drive it with any degree of comfort. Oh, and uh, your husband's a rising young politician. You're wrong. And that's another thing I know. You're a bad liar. <laughs> I also know that this cottage is in Sussex. What? On the borders of Kent. How do you know that? Oh, I'm blind, my lady, not deaf. My four senses are keener than your five. Look, on the way, I told you I had a clock strike. Hmm? It was a cathedral clock. I recognized it. The sunrise was straight ahead, you said. So just after that, we must have been traveling due east. And we traveled up and down hills. My guess is that we drove along the Sussex Downs. There's going to be a storm. Storms are bad in this part of the country. We might get snowed up. I hope not yet. What do you mean? Oh, well, I was thinking... I must look the most awful derelict. Who's to see you? Oh, it, it's not a matter of vanity. A fraying cup, threadbare jacket, blood-stained shirt. A man in, in her ladyship's house looking like a criminal on the run. You're not going to be seen. Not even by accident. Mrs. Spedding almost caught us. <laughs> well, I... I... Oh, no charity. Here. Five pounds. Spend them. Buy me some new clothes. If I start buying clothes in the village... The then... nearest town, then. How far is that? It's short of a man's outfitters. Perhaps. A razor. New shirts. A jacket. Go tomorrow. Well, it's early closing tomorrow. Is it so? I'll be more careful what I say in future. Stella, my dear, you're still down in the country, I hope. How's the weather with you? It's very cold here. One of the servants is there. Thank you, Hunter. That will be all. Has he gone? Yes. Where have you been, Stephen? I daren't ring too often in case they think it's odd. Been? I've been about my ordinary business, my dear, here in town. I've had to buy him some clothes. Damn. Have you given them to him yet? No. I, I thought I'd ask you first what right, you thought. Now, listen. Cut off all the labels. What? Anything which tells where or when the clothes might have been made or bought. Remove it. Why? My dear, if you didn't, he would read them. Oh, Stephen, how can he read them? I told With you. With his fingertips, my dear. He'd read the stitching, and that might give away the name of the place where you bought them. Oh. Why else? It, it isn't so that... So that... So that he won't be identified. I mean, if he was... If he was found dead, I mean... Dear me. Do you detest him as much as that? Do you really find his company so abhorrent that you... Oh, Stephen! And I was thinking that you were rather fond of the poor man. Has he told you his name yet? Stella? What? Does he still refuse to tell you his name? Uh, yes. Yes, he does. Just Sandy. He's a Scot. It seems better to leave it like that. Very wise. Too much knowledge can hang a man. Or a woman. Please stop teasing me like this, Stephen. Teasing? All this talk of death and hanging. Please, Stephen, what am I to do? I'm beginning to feel that you... I've what, my dear? Deserted me. Deserted you? <laughs> now that's odd. All our friends are beginning to think it's the other way round. Why are you tormenting me like this? Uh, listen, my dear, I have to go into the constituencies for a few weeks. A few weeks? If there is a crisis and this tramp makes accusations, deny them. But, Stephen... Damn it, Stella, you either deny him or you deny me. Now, which of us will it be? Pull yourself together. Won't be for much longer. Thank you for ringing. Good night. Found near the Reform Club on Sunday last. No. Missing from home, Daisy Evelyn Mary. No. Alexander David Kinloch will uh, hear something oh, to his advantage by communicating with Messrs. Selwyn and Smith, Devon Chambers, Chancery Lane. Liberal rewards. No. Compton, Rodney and Elizabeth wish to thank all kind friends. What are you doing? What I do every morning. 
sifting through the agony columns, missing persons. Why are you concentrating on this blind man? Why don't you go straight for the murderer, like Inspector Snodgrove? Because that man is a known quantity. With routine inquiries, legwork, paperwork, sooner or later Snodgrove will get him. Matheson will have kittens if he does. And the trouble is he won't be able to make it stick. Uh, uh, because our murderer's got pals and high faces? No. Because the crime itself was well planned and he's got nerves of steel. Matheson says... I know what your editor says. I've got it here. Who is the murderer's friend? Time. Time bloats out vital evidence, dulls the memories of important witnesses and lessens public outrage at this abominable crime. So it does. Our man knows that. Except for one set of fingerprints on a tumbler, not one of those incredible clues could be traced to him. Time's working for him on that side. It's also working against him on the other. What other? The unexpected. The longer he has that blind man to cope with, the more difficult it's getting. He may have killed him by now. Perhaps he has. But dead or alive, what's he going to do with him? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Why are you counting? I, I'm trying to judge the length of your hair from the strokes of your hairbrush. Oh. It's, uh, it's been a long time since a woman wore her hair over her shoulders in, in, in my company. You're blushing. It's nothing to me what you look like. I'm not beautiful. No. I got the impression you were. Not from me. No, not from you. From whom? Two people walking on the common. The wind blew their conversation towards my window. When? A week ago. You forget that a blind man lives in his mind and in his imagination. And tonight, I picture you as you sit there in your long silk robe. Oh, it's long, but it isn't silk. Just an ordinary penoir. Oh. <laughs> Dinner at eight. Soup and fish. No, it, it's just a comfortable sort of robe. I got it in the town when I bought your things. It's not a bit Duclos. Not what? Duclos. What's Duclos? Dressmaker. It's ended. What has? Oh, this little oasis of time. Being snowed in. Cut off. You'll be able to buy your newspapers again. Listen. The snow melting in the eaves. Can you not hear? No, it's, it's curious. I'm, I'm not apprehensive for my own safety. I'm worried for yours. You needn't be. Things have changed, haven't they? Changed? We've... Watched each other closely for every waking minute we've been here. I'm no longer the, the derelict who can be dropped when it suits you, am I? Am I? Answer me, Stella. Please. I can't. Don't you understand? I can't. Didn't they give you a disability pension? What? Oh, uh, yes, yes. They gave me a disability pension. I, I commuted it into a lump sum. Oh, you squandered it, I suppose. You sound like a wife before wives took to shingling their hair. I didn't blow that money. It went in tea shares. <laughs> Calendar tea shares. Nine pence each they were. Friend advised me to buy. I believe there are thousands in my name, all completely unsaleable. I brought you back a present when I was last in the town. Mm -hmm. Hold out your hands. There. What is it? You tell me. It, it's Braille. It's a book in Braille. Travels with a donkey. I thought you might get bored when I'm out of the house. Or inquisitive. You want to keep me occupied, is that it? Oh, women don't use force, do they? They use guile. Well, your hair being brushed is stupefyingly beautiful to my ear. 
In a gentle way, you first bathed my head. Good food, wine, soft, clean linen. And always the scent of your body. Oh, you almost lulled me into forgetting, my lady. I don't read Braille. I can't. I won't admit that I'm not as able as you. And when you move, I want to be ready to jump. Come in, please, Doctor. Uh, Doctor, uh, no. I, um, I have your card here. Thank you. My name is Dunn. And you're Mr. Selwyn or Mr. Smith? Uh, well, actually, my name is Spencer, Dr. Dunn. Uh, Mrs. Selwyn and Smith died more than 50 years ago. Ah. Uh, um, what may I do for you? Uh, it's your advertisement. Alexander David Kinlock will hear something to his advantage if he communicates with your firm. Now, will you give me your word that it really will be to his advantage? I mean, I'm actually trying to find him myself. And, um, will you give me your word to the same effect, Doctor? Oh, that I will. Well, it's clear that we both mean well by this young gentleman. We'd almost concluded he was dead. Well, he was alive on January the 15th. He called at my house in Ealing. To tell you the truth, he came in rags. He was a broken man, and it, to my eternal shame, I sent him away without help. I see. Dear me, in that case, he must be found at once. While he may not be rich, he'll certainly be comfortably off. What? All I need is his signed agreement to sell some of his shares. Well, he won't see your advertisement, Mr. Spencer. We'll have to find another way. Sandy! Sandy! What is it? There's another advertisement in the newspaper for you, for Alexander David Kinloch. What? And they've changed the wording. What, what do you mean, how changed the wording? Oh, it's not the same. Listen. Alexander David Kinloch, last seen in Ealing on the night of Monday, January the 15th. Any Read per- that again. Alexander David Kinloch, last seen in Ealing on the night of Monday, January the 15th. Full Any- stop? What? Well, yes. January the 15th, full stop. Then... Any person able to supply information as to his present whereabouts, kindly communicate with Messrs. Selwyn and Smith, Devon Chambers, etc., same as before. I know the date. And Ealing. Will any person not... Will Alexander David Kinlaw? Oh, no. What does it mean? And why have they changed it? They must know. They must know that I couldn't have read that first notice. That's why they've rephrased it. But what does it mean? They know I'm blind. But who is it? Either the police... Or your husband. My husband? He's the only other person who knows I was there that night. Why should he advertise? It's a trick. He wants me to make a move. He can't. He can't move without incriminating himself. Stalemate. Oh, I did warn you. A hostage is a dangerous liability. You neither of you know what to do with me, do you? What was that? Shh. What is it? There's somebody in the house. Undone. You must hide. Take my hand. Yeah. Quick. Oh! Pop him to sight again, is he? That jack in the box of yours. Mrs. Spenty, what on earth? I seen him not half an hour ago, and not for the first time neither. You've been spying. Locked him in the spare room, didn't you? Till you got so breezing the pair of you. And he took to a settin' before the fire. Well, I had a good look at him through the window while he was a-dozing, so you needn't try hiding him again. Mrs. Spetty! Don't you, Mrs. Spetty, me. Oh, the innocent I was. And I come across here in the dark because I was worried about you being on your own. And I found you wasn't so lonely as I thought. But he's only a friend, Mrs. Spetty. Only a friend? You was a-sitting half-naked before the fire with him. <gasps> no! I saw you through them very window curtains. I see you a brushing your hair with your arms and your shoulders white in shameless nakedness before his very eyes. There's nothing wrong, I assure you. Then what's he hiding for? Oh, Miss Teller, you're in love with this man, aren't you? How dare you? Give him up. Give him up, do, before it's too late. Give me up, Miss Teller. There's nothing more for you to worry about, Mrs. Spetty. I'm taking him away. What are we making for? Wherever you want to go. Uh, do you mind if I open this window? 
You get soaked. The sea's running very high. No. No, it's glorious. Listen. Good Lord, Revali. I hadn't thought to hear that again. Takes me back to the war. Is it raining? Where do you want to go? How long will it take to get from here to Scotland? Scotland? I don't know. Three days? Scotland, then. All right, Scotland. But when we get there, I want you to forget everything. You understand, don't you, Sandy? Everything. Will you give me your word? As a gentleman? I know you're a gentleman. But I'll... I'll strike a bargain with you. What's that? When we part, you'll leave me with two things. And those are? A bottle of scotch. And a kiss. Dr. Dunn? Dr. Dunn? Over here. Ah, oh, good man. You got my telegram? Uh, Euston Midnight. I've never moved so fast in my life. Here, give me your bag. Where you follow? Uh, I don't think so. For one, this for armed. Ever since you told me I was being watched, I've kept a lookout just in case. Who was he? Do you know? I thought at first he must be Kinlock himself. He came into my office, as I told you, inquiring about the advertisement. And he was a Scot. Oh, yes. But a red-headed. I wonder who the devil it was. No matter. Not if you've given him the slip. Uh, now. Yes, Mr. Spencer, now. Why are we going to Scotland? Read this. It arrived in my office today. Messrs. Selwyn and Smith will send someone to Mr. Keeler, who's Mr. Keeler. Read on. Now staying at the Abalundi Arms, Gart, Argyleshire, they can obtain full information about Alexander David Kinlock. Well, who's Mr. Keeler? I suspect he might be Mr. Kinlock himself. Look at the handwriting. If Messrs. Selwyn and Smith... Whoever wrote it used parallel rulers to guide his pen. See, each line is straight in itself, but rises towards the right hand because the ruler is not set straight across the paper. Of course. Isn't that how the blind are taught to write? Between two rulers? Yes. Mr. Spencer, I think we're on our way to him at last. A biscuit, Mr. Chance? No, thanks. A cup of tea? McNabb, it's been ten weeks. I know. And Inspector Snartrove is still looking for a man who must be under his very nose. I haven't been idle while you've been covering other assignments, you know. And at least I know now precisely who it is I'm looking for. You do? I've even got a photograph of him. What? Here. Men of the 7th Battalion leaving for the front. He's among this lot. That one. What's his name? Ken Loch. Oh, Scott. Well, how did you find him? This advertisement in the agony column. Here. Alexander David Kinloch, last seen in Ealing on the night of Monday, January the 15th. Wouldn't that intrigue you? Good Lord, yes. Well, it didn't, did it? You missed it. Uh. Nine-tenths of our blind men lost their sight in war service. I thought it was a fair assumption that our chap was among them. I took his name round to the war record office. Within half an hour, I'd got his service history and this photograph of him. Then I went to the premises of the advertisers, Messrs. Selwyn and Smith, and waited for Kinloch to turn up. And did he? No. But there was somebody else waiting for him, a Dr. Peter Dunn. I followed him. Once I checked his history, I thought he'd lead me to Kinloch. And has he? No, damn it. He's left a locum in charge of his practice and disappeared. And? He's given me the slip, bloody. I don't know where he is. Mr. Keeler? That's me. My name is Spencer. Ah, yes. Uh, my friend and I were looking for a Mr. Kinlock, actually. Alexander David Kinlock. Uh-huh. Are you Mr. Kinlock, sir? Yes, I am. 
I have a friend of yours with me, sir, who can identify you. A friend? No, you must be mistaken. I have no friends. Not even me, Sandy. Dunn. Is it Peter Dunn? Yes. I'm sorry to hear it. I'm sorry it was you who played the Judas. Judas? All right, Inspector, Superintendent, or whoever you are, make your arrest. I shan't resist. Man, what are you talking about? He's a policeman, isn't he? Mr. Kinlock, I'm not a policeman. I am a solicitor. I come to discuss your holding in Calendar T. Your tea shares. Tea shares? Tea shares? What kind of joke is this? It's no joke, Sandy. <laughs> tea shares? Oh, my God. God! You have a holding for which there are people willing to pay you 41 shillings. 41 shillings? For 2,000 T-shares? Not for all of them, Mr. Kinlock. For each one. 41 shillings each. You're a rich man, Mr. Kinlock. Rich. 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 Sandy. Where am I? In a clinic. In a private room in a clinic. Well? Well, you've had a bit of a collapse. When? Three weeks ago. You've had very few lucid moments since. Oh, I, 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 I remember that there was a policeman. No, not not a policeman. And something about about tea shares. That's right. But I, I, I was at an inn in in the Highlands. How did you find me? You told us where you were. Oh yes. Now why? I wanted to confess. Confess? To what? That murder in Ealing. You didn't do that. Oh, come on, Peter. Look, my life's worthless. I faced that. Hanging's merely one way of ending it, that's all. I... I can at least save somebody else's life by confessing. What are you saying? Give her a fresh start. There's only one life to consider at the moment, my lad. It's too late, Peter. Listen. That night in Ealing, I saw that your eyes might respond to surgery. You see, Sandy, there are new techniques now. There's only one surgeon in this country who can perform that operation at the moment, and he's here in this clinic. You... You mean he... He might be able to operate on me? I mean, he already has. What? It's done, Sandy. You've had the operation. It hasn't worked. Put your hand to your face. But... Oh, bandages. You mean I'm, I'm still in bandages? They're to be taken off this afternoon. Sit down, Mr. Chance. You're making me nervous. Do you really think he'll come? You said four o'clock. He's long overdue. Only five minutes. There. Come in. My name is Dunn. <laughs> Dr. Dunn. Dunn. I'm Francis McNabb. We haven't actually met. I know met. you by sight. You've followed me on several occasions. Oh, dear. Not very discreetly, obviously. Uh, Mr. Godfrey Chance, the journalist, you already know. Uh, Monday, the 15th of January, Ealing. Uh, uh, yes, I I was called out that night. How do you do? When did you last see Mr. Kinloch, Dr. Dunn? Kinloch? Kinloch, I, I recall having heard the name, but I... Take a look at this photograph. Good Lord. You recognize him. It's how I remember him before the war. Blindness doesn't alter a man all that much. You know he was blinded. Doctor, you must tell me where he is. I can't. The man's in great danger. All right. He was there when Padgett was murdered. But he didn't kill him. I know that. Do the police. He has nothing to fear by coming forward. Without protection, his life is at risk. Oh, he doesn't give a damn for his own safety. There's a woman. Ah, the looking glass. The fragment of pocket mirror. You were right, McNabb. La femme. The woman is shielding him, is she? Oh, quite the reverse. 
After being in hiding with him for nearly two months, she suddenly dumped him and disappeared. Oh, the man's mad. He was safely out of this appalling mess and he's gone straight back into it. How? Why? Oh, the woman bewitched him. He doesn't know who she is, where she is, where she lives, nothing. But he's determined to find her. And that's what he's doing now, searching for her? I imagine so. He refused to tell me his plans. Didn't want me to be implicated, he said. Y you mean he's on his own? A blind man looking for an unknown woman on his own? She's not unknown to him. He knows a thousand things about her. The sound of her voice, the inflections of her speech, her likes, her dislikes. Don't forget, it's when we think people can't see us that we give ourselves away. And the blind have a perceptiveness that sighted mortals like us can't comprehend. You say he has plans? Apparently. Uh-huh. He'll find out. And I think I know how. How? Use your imagination, Doctor. If you were blind, how would you set about it? Ah, but... But what? <laughs> <laughs> now what the dickens? What's so funny? But I'm not. I was going to say, I'm not blind. McNab! McNab! You found him? Not sure, but there are eight blind men who've just taken pictures. Five in the West End, three in Knightsbridge. What are they doing? Uh, selling matches. All of them? Yes, but only one of them might be our man. He's got a book in Braille. Good. He's sitting on a camp stool with the book open on his lap, and he's reading aloud from the Braille. Where is he? Uh, Enderby Gardens, Knightsbridge. Did you notice if he was anywhere near a dressmaker's establishment? Dressmakers? The London season is almost upon us. According to Dunn, Kinloch reckons the lady is in society. She'll be visiting a dressmaker. And regularly. It's the obvious place for him to take his pitch. Hmm. But suppose you're right. And suppose she walks past him. How's he going to know? He won't be able to recognise her. No, but she'll recognise him. Well, not this chap in nights, but she won't. Huh? He's got thick, dark glasses on, oh. hat pulled down over his eyes. Ah, that's why he's reading aloud, don't you see? He wants her to recognise him by his voice. Oh, I see. He's in great danger. The police are still looking for him, and so is someone else. Heaven knows what will happen when the lady realises she's been traced. Let's go and have a look at him. In the Lord, what hope my trust, now say ye to my soul. There he is. Brave man. If Paget's murderer man, finds him, he'll kill him without compunction. Poor daylight. He murdered Paget to save his reputation. He'll certainly kill this man to save his neck. If this man is Kinloch. He says his name's Hollins. I, I talked to him this morning, past the time of day. It says he's a Cockney bricklayer blinded in the war. Cockney, eh? Listen. Go and talk to him again. Oh, what shall I say? Anything, doesn't matter. I just want you to knock his hat off. Knock his hat off? Yes. Then give it him back and ask if he can try reading the Braille. Me? Of course you. Why do you want me to knock his hat off? Just do it. Get him to lift his hands off the pages of his book just for a second and I'll be standing beside you. I do. That's interesting. What? Haven't you noticed? He hasn't got a stick. Well, I'm blowed. Whatever you do, don't let him know that I'm there. And a horrible tempest. And this shall be the portion of their cup. Afternoon? Oh. Afternoon, Gov. You back again? You don't forget voices, do you? Uh, not them as comes along of half a crown. Like what you done this morning. Your ears are as good as eyes. And so are your fingers, I suppose. I wonder if I could see what my fingers make of your... Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Here, me hat. Uh, clumsy me. Let me dust it for you. Oh, here. Me book. Me, me Bible. Where's me book? Uh, here it is. No damage. Mm. And your hat. I'm awfully sorry to be so clumsy. It's all right, Gov. All in the date. Yeah. Yeah, what's happened to my book? The page is smooth. Here, what's this? Paper? Uh, let Piece me... of paper. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, no, there's nothing there. Feel. Who's beside me? And who's there? Uh, nobody. Yeah, what's going on? Here. Here's half a crown. What did you flick that paper under my fingers for? Come on, chance. Taxi. Taxi. Here. Come back. Come back. Good of you both to come to the yard. That was a crafty bit of work. Thank you, Inspector. 
I can now tell you that the fingerprints on this sheet of paper are not the same as the ones found on the whiskey glass. Good. Mark you. They match the prints that were plastered everywhere else in that room at Ealing, but not the ones on the glass. That proves there was another man there. Mm. And you say that this man's hair matches the hairs in Paget's study... Same texture and colour as these you um, lent me. Uh, without a lab test, we can't place too much reliance on that. Still... Two things convince me that this man is Kinloch. Oh? What are those? The most changeless feature of the human face is the forehead. Is it? You're right, McNabb. Even when you're bald like me, the hairline is always discernible. Look at this army photograph of Kinloch wearing a Glengarry. Look at his forehead. Our blind friends is precisely the same. Yeah. Hmm. What's the other thing? He's no more a cockney than I am. Oh, his accent convinced me. His accent, yes. His idiom, no. He said he remembered your voice along of the half crown you gave him. What's wrong with that? That along of. He used it to mean together with. When a cockney says along of, he means because of, not together with. You'd get six months along of pinching a wallet. Besides, he's a Scot. Did you not hear him put his tongue round the R in righteous? I'll get my man out there right away. You're not going to arrest him? No. He'll be the bait for the big fish. We'll grab them all. So long as someone doesn't grab him first. Snarker has just passed us in the police car. Did you notice... There is no truth in the rumour that Sir Stephen Ware will be nominated for the Bywitch Division. What are you talking about? I'm quoting an item from the eye-opener, January the 15th. It was on Snarkgrove's desk. Just now, you mean? Yes. He's obviously still checking everybody that Paget had attacked in Flint. Routine inquiries. Good old Snarkgrove. Stop on the corner of Enderby Gardens, cabby. Right, I go. Oh, spot the bother there, Governor. But look at them two coppers. Pull over, quick! Right. Here. Oh, thanks, Governor. Inspector Snarkdorf. They've got him, McNabb. Snatched him. How? Oh, when? Sergeant. Oh, not five minutes ago, sir. A man and a woman drove up in the Rolls Royce. The lady got out. She's walking past the blind man. Suddenly, she goes as white as a sheet. Then she sort of... Well, uh, took ill, as you might say. And the man jumped out of the rolls and rushed to catch her. She was sort of swaying. He put her in the car. The blind man was standing up, and then he grabbed the man. What? Well, it's hard to tell who grabbed who, really. It was a bit of a scuffle. I rushed forward, and someone stuck out a foot, and over I went. <laughs> the time I was up, they'd all driven away. Descriptions of the man and woman. Oh, oh yes, sir. Was the woman bald, shingled, or had she long hair? Well, it wasn't short, sir. The man? Next officer in Mufti, I'd say. Number of the car? Oh, uh, no, sir. Like I say, Get I those right. descriptions out immediately. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, one other thing, sir. What's that? Well, this uh, blind man, he can see. What did you say? I swear he could see. What? Good Lord. Oh, oh of course. That's why Dr. Dunn laughed. Those thick, dark glasses he was wearing. Surgical lenses. And the absence of any stick. Well done, Sergeant. Did he give himself away to the others, do you think? Oh, I couldn't say, sir. A taxi! Taxi! Hey! Where are you off to, Mr. Chance? Back to Fleet Street. No time for that. You and I are going for the big one. The exclusive on the arrest. Once they find he can see, his goose is cooked. Now, Kinloch told Dunn that he reckoned the cottage was somewhere near the Kent coast. He remembered travelling alongside the sea. What we've got to find is a coast guard who knows every inch of that littoral from Rochester to Rye. Right. You've got details of the place Kinloch described so vividly to Dunn. If I can read my own shorthand. Right, sir. Ask away. Ask away. If I can read my notes, Mr. Talbot. Uh, going west, a road down a steep hill. At the foot of the hill, you're suddenly so close to the sea, uh, this is travelling by car, you're in a car, uh, that at oh. high tide, you feel the spray on your face. After about a mile, you turn away from the sea and you don't hear it again. Oh, this is hard. There's a score of places. You feel both the spray and the sun on your left cheek. Oh, well, that's better. Wipes out all North Coast, don't it? Well, sounds a bit like Pegwell Bay, sir. Pegwell Bay? 
No, 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 that can't be right. Think, man, think. A life is in danger. Um, Walmer. Yeah, Walmer to a T. Walmer? No. No, wait a minute. It's uh, Shingle Beach. Noisy Shingle Beach. Well, all the beaches is shingle thereabouts. Uh, leastways till you get to Dimchurch. There's Dover. But that's not a village. At high water of the springtide, with the noise of surf, you might hear a trumpet. A what, sir? A trumpet, man, a trumpet. Up to your right on higher ground. Dang me. I know the very spot, then. You do? Yeah, Shorncliffe Camp, that is, lies between Folkestone and Hythe. There's the, the long hill down before you enter Sandgate. Where on the map? Quick, man, quick. Well, now then... Uh, uh, here it is. Kinlock heard the bugle playing the Revalley, and they hadn't travelled far from the cottage when they heard it. Oh, so well, that now, cottage uh... must be somewhere within this radius. Mm. And the village is unusual because it's got gates at either end of it. Come on, chaps, we might be just in time... Look, they're all three of them inside the cottage. What's happening? That's what's so odd. Nothing. Still nothing? No. It's as if they were waiting for someone or something. You can see through the curtains here. Kinloch's still wearing his dark glasses. Yes, I don't think they know he can see. No, I'm sure they don't. Otherwise, he'd be dead. Let's go round the back. We can hear what they're saying through the kitchen window. Why, your leaves from Dover on the end at 11 o'clock. What time is it now? You have 30 minutes left. Then we leave. We? Naturally, I'm taking my wife with me. She pitied you last time, Kinloch, so I spared your life. Now she's in love with you. Steve! And I presume you're in love with her. You'd be a fool to presume anything about me at this moment. If Weir tries to make a dash for it, we've got to stop him. Well, how do we do that? There's his Rolls Royce over there. Go and smash the lights. Right. I hope Kinloch knows what he's doing. Seriously think I'd let you live, do you? You think I destroyed one blackmailer to put myself in the clutches of another? And probably my own wife's as well. You swine, she's been loyal to you throughout. She couldn't have given evidence against her husband anyway. Padgett was right. You are not fit to be a representative of your country. Oh, Padgett's little errand boy wants to copy his master, does he? You're right. He shall. Stephen! Your ears will tell you what that noise was, eh, Kinloch? You remember you heard it before, hmm? You recognize the steel of my knife blade, don't you? Come on, yes, that's right, come on. You know your way around this room, don't you? All those weeks when you were living here with my wife. Be careful, Sandy. He's moving across the fireplace. So I see. What? I said yes. So I see. My God, I believe you can. Sandy, look out! No, you don't, what the devil! Sandy, Sandy, darling! Get out of my way! Get him, Chance, get him! You can see! You can see! Don't let him get away! Stop! Do you think you can move? Oh, get him, you young idiot! Get him! Chance, Chance, you're all right. Yes, sir. Uh, stay there. I'm coming to... What did you say? Quickly, we must get an ambulance for chance. He's in no fit state to see I anyone. assure you, nurse, he'll want to see me. I'm his boss. McNabb? Oh, Mr. Matheson. All right. Five minutes, no more. Well, what's it feel like to make the front page? <laughs> Painful. Paget killer caught by chance. Godfrey Chance, ace reporter of the Daily Record, last night... Well, who wrote that? Who else but the record special correspondent? Inspector Snargrove of Scotland Yard has named Sir Stephen Ware in the Punsonby Paget case. On the night of the murder, we are informed Sir Stephen had retired early to bed. Then he got up, dressed, and went out to intercept his wife as she was returning from the country. He persuaded her to drive him to Mr. Paget's house in Ely. As simple as that. The poor girl was terrified of him. Afterwards, she went back home to bed and in the morning told the servants she decided to stay in the country. Oh, wait a minute. You can't publish this. It's subdued to What about his trial? He's dead. Dead? Went over a cliff in his car. Oh. But not, I gather, because his headlights had been smashed. Ah. Uh, no, no, I didn't. Well, there wasn't time. What happened to Kinloch? 
Kinloch, I'm sorry to say, is in paradise. Kinloch was killed? No, no. He's gazing into the eyes of his beloved. They tell me that's a sort of paradise. Personally, I'd rather have a biscuit. Now, we've brought you some grapes and exchanges, no robbery. Uh, you don't happen to have any in this locker, I suppose. In The Man in the Dark, dramatised for radio by Gwen Cheryl from the novel by John Ferguson, Kinloch was played by Robert Trotter, Stella by Karin Fernald, Chance by Christopher Schooler, and McNabb by Kenneth McClellan. Douglas Blackwell was Matheson, Malcolm Gerrard, Sir Stephen Ware, David Graham, Inspector Snargrove, Peter Craze, Dr. Dunn, James Thomason, the solicitor Spencer, and David Bird, Punsonby Paget. Mrs. Spedding was played by Shirley Dixon, Tolput by Michael Harbour, Inspector Green by Malcolm Reed, Sergeant Howley by Walter Hall, a cab driver by Andrew Sear, and Beaumont by Hayden Jones. Love's Old Sweet Song was played on the cornet by Graham Whiting, and the play was produced and directed by John Cardy. <laughs>